So let's start with hypothesis testing. We will not get into the details because here intention is uh, just to be aware about the concept such that when we get to ANOVA and start talking about the technical terms there, we can relate to what it means from a hypothesis testing perspective. Now, while in an improvement project or uh, when we simulate performances in a design project, a critical task is to compare the performance of two samples. It may be a pre-post scenario or performance of two designs or options or factor levels. So how do we go about it? Obviously, first we collect the data around such samples. Then we do our basic calculations to find the mean of each sample and see which sample appears to be better. Once we have this calculated mean and then we back it up by our process experience, that's when we are in a position to uh, make an hypothesis that one sample is better than other, as that's what the mean is telling us. But as we discussed in section 1 of this tutorial, it may be misleading to just go by the mean. We must account for the variance in data as it plays the spoil sport most of the times in kicking the mean off the target. So we use specialized tools based on the type of data and type of samples we have to further analyze the variance and ascertain if the calculated means will stay put in the long term. This specialized analysis falls under the gambit of hypothesis testing. As we started off in section 1, we end up uh, making two hypotheses in statistical testing. First, as we said, we want to rule out the possibility that the two sample performances are equal. As then only uh, we need to further analyze if one is better than the other. So our first hypothesis would be that there is no significant difference in sample means. And this is what we call null hypothesis. So let's take an example. Let's say a person is being tried in the court of law for an offense. So the judge would always hear the plea assuming the defendant is not guilty unless proven otherwise. So that's, that's about the null hypothesis. Now this hypothesis may be right or wrong. That's what we try to prove through our subsequent analysis. So if this hypothesis is wrong, then we need to know what should be right. And that would be our alternate hypothesis, which in this case we can state as one of the sample means is better than the others. Again, to understand, let's take the court of law example. Now, can we think what goes on in the mind of the prosecutor? The prosecutor would believe that the defendant is guilty and he or she will furnish all evidences to give enough confidence to the judge to take a decision that the defendant is guilty. Now, we can make out from the above example that mistakes will happen when we are working with hypothesis. As we are basing our statistical decisions on the data gathered, which in turn may be incomplete or may have missed out critical events in the process. So chance of an error cannot be ruled out. And beauty of hypothesis testing is that it's not that high ego entity. It acknowledges that mistakes do happen and provides for two types of errors. First is type 1 error. This happens when we reject the null hypothesis when it is true. Like we hypothesize that sample means are equal. And let's say in reality also they are similar, they are equal. But we ended up rejecting the null hypothesis and believing that they are different. Now in a business scenario, if you reject a product or a service that is of high quality, then the maximum loss would be for the producer. So this error is also called producer's risk. And lastly, but very important, if we want to reduce this error, our rejection criteria should be strict. Now in hypothesis testing, we assign a level of significance during the testing, which is called alpha. It's normally taken at 5%. What it means is that while testing our hypothesis, we do not want to make an error greater than 5%. 
5% in wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis. And 100 minus alpha is called the level of confidence. So in this case, it would mean that we would have 95% confidence on our statistical decisions, which in turn would mean that there would be those 5% instances where our statistical decision stands a chance to be wrong. Now this is very important to understand. So let's spend a little more time on this concept. Let's say this is a normal distribution. Area under this curve would be 100% in total. When we take a level of significance of 5% and let's say it's a lower the better metric, like for example defect rate, then we can mark the 5% and 95% area like this. In the right tail, this marked area corresponds to 5% area under the curve. Let's say uh, in our analysis, we find the probability of a highly defective event to be 0.01 or 1%. Since the calculation is based on the sample that we believe to be a part of this population, we would assume that this 0.01 probability is the part of this distribution in the right tail area. So we can infer that this event belongs to distribution 1. But would that be right? Ideally, we would want the event probability to lie in the 95% area as then we would be 95% confident about our decision. Here it is lying in the 5% area. So we say that we just have 5% confidence that this event belongs to distribution 1. This event may have a higher that is 95% chance of belonging to some other population. Let's say distribution 2. Now this distribution 2 in real life scenario represents the other sample being compared or, or other design option being considered. So, we, if we would have assumed that this event belonged to distribution 1, then we would have committed an error, isn't it? And similar to type 1 error, we also have type 2 error. And this is when we accept a false alternate hypothesis. In a business scenario, it is like accepting a defective product or service and would obviously have a higher impact on the consumer. So it's also called consumer's risk. In this case, we don't want to make an error more than beta in wrongly accepting a false alternate hypothesis. And obviously to reduce this error, our acceptance criteria needs to be stricter. Now do remember always that if we reduce one type of error, the other type will increase. So the judgment needs to be made as per the process requirement. Like if we take the court of law example, our null hypothesis was that defendant is not guilty. Let's say actually the defendant was not guilty, but we end up prosecuting the person. So what we have done, we have committed type one error, rejecting null hypothesis when it was true. And to avoid this mistake in future, we have to make our prosecution criteria very strict. It's good for us, as then a not guilty defendant will never be prosecuted. But then what will happen on the other side? Now since the prosecution criteria is very strict, there would be cases where a guilty person will also escape prosecution in some cases. That is our probability to type 2 error where we accept a false alternate hypothesis will increase, which still in this case may be acceptable to us. So the choice of which criteria needs to be made stricter will depend on the 
criticality of the process and the objective that we want to achieve from it. Now depending on what we are comparing and testing, the tools in hypothesis testing will differ. The choice of the right tool or the right option is the first important step in this testing. So the choice would primarily depend on the type of data we are handling and whether we are comparing means or, or specifically we just want to compare variance. So let's look at the various tools or options that we have in hypothesis testing. First, decide on what data types we are handling. Is the data discrete or is it continuous? If it's discrete, we use chi-square test. If it's continuous, we need to understand if we want to benchmark mean or variance. If we want to benchmark variance, then we use the F-test. But if we are benchmarking mean, then we need to understand if we are comparing only two samples or more than that. If we are comparing only two samples, then first we need to know if we have access to the population variance. Now, we rarely have access to population data, but let's say we do, then the choice is z-test. More often we are working with samples and, and we do not have much information around the population. That's why we end up using the t-test more often. So we use z and t-test while comparing two samples. But if we are comparing more than two, that's when we turn to ANOVA. Here too, we may have just one factor, but this factor has many levels. Then our choice has to be one-way ANOVA. But if it's a more complex scenario where we have two factors with each factor having many levels, then we use two-way ANOVA. Now this tool-based categorization is very important to remember in this type of statistical comparison. I hope this video was useful. We would always be delighted to see your likes, comments and mails as we consider you an integral part of our learning endeavor. Keep watching this space as we plan to host more learning videos on concepts from DMAC, Lean, DFSS, Reengineering, Theory of Constraints, BPM and Operations Research. Please do subscribe to the page and keep receiving updates as and when we upload a new tutorial. Do share the links or channel details in your group so we end up creating a much larger learning community. In case you want us to talk about any specific concept, feel free to contact us. The contact details are mentioned here on the slide as well as on the page. So good luck and happy learning.